Well, a very warm welcome to each of you. Thanks for uh, joining us for this uh, Work With Purpose online session. We're grateful to have Will Messenger with us today. Will is uh, executive editor of the Theology of Work Project. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with Theology of Work Project, understand uh, uh, the magnitude of this resource uh, that has been made available to the Christian community and uh, provides a extensive commentary uh, in the Bible on uh, themes related to faith and work. And we're going to have the pleasure of hearing a lot about this resource today from Will. So this is focused on the Theology of Work Project and preparing leaders to serve workplace Christians. Uh, I want to highlight a few things as we enter into this time and uh, engage together. First of all, we uh, are just wanting to say a warm welcome to you. And my name is Justin Irving. Uh, I serve here as the interim vice president and dean of Bethel Seminary, and uh, I have the pleasure of giving direction to our Work with Purpose initiative. Uh, Work with Purpose here at Bethel is designed to help uh, seminary students and pastoral leaders and ministry leaders uh, engage the Christian community on a theology of work and helping them understand why their everyday life matters from a kingdom perspective. And we're going to hear a lot of these themes today as we engage with Will Messenger. Uh, the theology of work here at Bethel in our Work with Purpose initiative really is targeted around equipping the church to effectively engage in the ministry of everyday life and everyday work. Uh, we focus on future pastors here in the seminary context and also current pastors uh, regionally around our two campuses in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota and San Diego, California, and of course uh, beyond the region as well through online resources like this session that we have today. So, Will, we are very grateful for your presence with us. Uh, thanks for taking time to share with us a bit more about the Theology of Work Project and this extensive resource that uh, you, you and others are blessing the church with. Thanks for all you do, and we look forward to hearing from you today. Thanks, Justin. It's a pleasure to be here, and the, the long uh, number of years I've been working with you and with Bethel makes me delighted to, um, to be part of this. Um, I think we should dive right in. Uh, maybe I could give you a little bit of, of background of sort of where what I'm talking about uh, will come from. And, and that is, uh, I, I was 10 years at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary leading their uh, Center for Faith and Ethics in the Workplace and Doctor of Ministry program in workplace leadership and business ethics. And so over that time, I had about 60 students um, who were leading churches. And so, so I've kind of worked with them not directly in their churches, but, but it, with them as students. And then I, in 2007, uh, 2007, I became director of the New Theology of Work Project. And uh, our, our team, which includes um, 17 uh, board members from around the world, has worked with probably a couple hundred churches. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of what I'm trying to talk about is how to go about this, this business of equipping people who are in churches to follow Jesus, to live, to, to work, as God intends them, whatever their work might be. And so a lot of that comes from the experiences that we as a group have had trying to work with churches to do that. So I should say that, that, that the vision, the big vision is that every Christian who works would be equipped to work as God intends. Um, and I'm not really, I'm, I'm kind of assuming that, that that vision is familiar to you. If it's not, you can ask about it in the Q&A, one of the Q&A moments. But I'm not really going to talk about exactly what that is, try to define what that is, or why that's important. I'm kind of going to assume that you, you have that or, or could come up with it later. I really want to talk about how. How would a church and its leaders and pastors go about equipping the people in that congregation to work as God intends? So another last bit of preliminary information is we've found that churches that are successful in doing this are almost always already on a missionary journey. And what we mean by that is that, uh, by missionary journey, is that they have a vision of, of a mission in the world beyond serving their existing congregation. Now, rightly so, churches spend a lot of time doing the weekly worship, taking care of the people in the congregation, pastoral care, discipleship, all the things that churches do, and that's great. But the churches that eventually become successful at equipping their people to go about God's mission in the world through their work, when they're not at church, seem to be churches that are already on a kind of missionary journey, whether that's evangelism, just 
evangelism to the world around them, whether it's sending missionaries overseas, whether it's a medical missionary sort of stuff, whether it's um, serving the community around them. But the churches that are successful have already developed a sense of God has put us together in this place for some kind of mission beyond ourselves. And they're beginning to ask, wouldn't it make sense for that mission to include the work our people do when they're not gathered as part of the church? So it's not just limited to the church-based activities. So that seems to be number one. The, the second is an attention to make this step to, to be equipping to be about equipping their people for their work. And that seems to take three parts. The first is promotion and support from the pastor. The pastor doesn't have to do everything, but really nothing happens in most churches. Nothing goes very far without the promotion and support of the pastor. And so we've seen it always takes a pastor, usually the senior pastor saying, this is, this is important to us. I'm gonna set the, uh, put this on the agenda. Uh, but number two, unlike some other activities in churches, it almost always takes lay leadership with enthusiasm. And I think the reason for that is probably because most pastors are not experts in the uh, work that the people in their congregation do outside of church. And so it seems in order to, to get the critical mass going, there also needs to be lay leadership. Not that lay leaders are experts necessarily in one another's work, but they, they can help set the agenda and make sure that the the equipping church is, is actually accomplishing what it intends. And the third is they almost always seem to need some kind of outside resources and or assistance. Most churches, aside from maybe the very largest, uh, find that they can't develop the resources they need to carry this out on their own. And so they look to the outside. And that's one reason Theology of Work Projects exists, is to try to provide resources. It's also, also with work with purpose. So you bring those two together, and that's the background we've seen for churches that have succeeded in equipping members to work as God intends. I call this possible success because there's, there's sort of no, uh, there's no guarantee. Uh, there's not a kind of, uh, if you follow this program, things will work out uh, perfectly, uh, but it does push you farther on this missionary journey. And we've seen some, some remarkable um, results. Now, how most churches get started is, um, if you look on this slide, there's this line on the bottom. My, my intent here is that the church is kind of going along on what it, whatever its journey is. And most churches are not thinking much about how do we keep, equip the people in our congregation to go about God's work when they're at their ordinary work. But something happens to kind of shift, shift usually the senior pastor off course a little bit. And that's why I've drawn these circles as deviating from the line. Um, Maybe the pastor goes to a conference or reads a book or something kind of jolts them a little bit and they think, oh, my people are spending 100,000 hours of their lives at work, whether that's paid work or unpaid work. Um, what am I doing to help them serve Jesus, follow, follow God in, in that time? And they may, they may read a book or go to a conference, whatever. They, they begin to encounter what I'm calling in this slide 101, the kind of basics of faith work integration. Uh, passages, you know, like Genesis, where, where we learned that God, God created work in the garden before the fall and people, before the fall, and people were made partly to complete the work of creation that God began. Uh, or uh, uh, Colossians, uh, Colossians 3.23, whatever your work, do it as unto the Lord. So there's kind of a, a, a group of passages and, and um, concepts, uh, like everyone's created to work, we're gifted for work, God calls people to all kinds of work work has some kind of heavenly or eternal value to form a core of understanding. And it may take some, some time for a, a, a pastor or any other leader to kind of take this all on board. Uh, at some point though, if it really takes, then uh, the leader says, I'd like to, um, to do something in my church, not just my personal understanding, but do something in church to bring this into reality. And what almost always happens, uh, I went farther than I intended to on that slide, What almost always happens is a sermon series on work. Of course, especially if it's the pastor uh, who's the one who's um, leading the charge. And, and that's great. Uh, so this will probably introduce the same uh, 101 concepts, the foundational concepts to the congregation that, that the pastor has just been encountering. But I would say that 
most sermon series, no matter how good they are, is, is not enough. Five sermons or four or, or 11, like the church I go to, uh, are not enough to really change the way people go about their work, not truly equip people for a lifetime of work. So the question I'm really interested in is, what happens after that? And we discovered so far that probably 80 to 90% of the churches who have gone on this journey of equipping have really not gotten past this part yet. So it's actually a fairly small number of churches that I'm now referring to in terms of what we've seen work. Nonetheless, a few do kind of move beyond the first sermon series. And this is what they begin to do. They find ways to equip their people for work through all the things congregations are already doing. A little bit, a small bite in every sermon, or almost every sermon. Doing a little bit in worship, music, liturgy, and prayers to, to highlight and, and pray for, sing about work. A little bit in the discipleship, especially small groups. And a little bit in the pastoral care and counseling of the church. And what I love about these examples is they don't have to add a workplace ministry. Uh, in fact, it's probably better if they don't. It's just they begin paying, paying attention to work on a weekly basis within the congregation in its life. I want to stop for just a moment now and see if anyone has any questions or contributions just for this basic understanding. All right, not, not seeing any questions or concerns. We'll have a time at the end, uh, at the end of, the, of the whole session for if you have more questions, if you want to keep them till then. I'm going to move on and talk about preaching. And then I think preaching is probably, well, preaching certainly sets the table, sets the agenda for what people in church talk about. Uh, I'm, sure you're, I'm sure if you're here, you believe in the value of preaching, so I won't, I won't belabor that, but to say that preaching could be an important way of equipping people for their life and work. And there's sort of two aspects. The one is this intro, introducing your church to work and vocation, and the second is including a little bit about it in every sermon. I want to say a little about both of those. The first is introducing your church to work and vocation. This can be very powerful. And the times when I have spoken in a congregation that has not really talked about this before, so I've been asked to give a sermon, sort of your work matters to God and here's why. I mean, there are, there are people afterwards who come up and want to talk to me and sometimes they're crying. They're saying, I, I, no one told me this. Or I didn't take this on board before that the work I do every day as a, as a business person or a teacher or whatever, uh, is actually work for God's service. It's, it's a very powerful um, a message. And so let's talk a little bit about how you might go about that if it hasn't happened in your church yet. We've assembled some resources on the Theology of Work Project website, and these are all free and available to anyone online at theologyofwork.org. Um, so although we're talking about our materials, I'm not too embarrassed about the infomercial because they are all free. This is our homepage, and if you went to it and clicked on the, uh, the button here, I am a pastor, then you would come to a kind of a pastor's portal, and you can see that the second row of resources is called Introduce Your, Intr Include Work in Your Preaching. Uh, and the arrow here is to the View All button, and the next slide is just, would show you what happens if you view all of what we have there about Include Work in Your Preaching. There's several resources. I want to highlight three in terms of introductions. Uh, the first one is called Introduce Your Church to Faith and Work with Five Core, five core Bible Passages. This just shows, if you clicked on it, it would show five passages with a little bit of an idea about how each one contributes to this core message. So it's, it's kind of some of those passages in that circle diagram I was showing. By the way, we're revising this, uh, and at some time in the future, it might not be called Five Core Bible Passages, but it will, because we think there might be four, more than five that we should highlight. Uh, but that kind of thing will always be there. Uh, another is sample sermons to introduce faith and work. And we've been privileged to collect a bunch of sermons uh, not written by members of our of our group uh, that do introduce faith and work, and you could peruse those and see if any of them kind of help you pattern sermon you might want to preach. The one I want to show a little bit more about is this last circle of one, recommended books and bibliographies about the theology of work. Let's go down to that. What we've done here is just to list a few of the books that the churches that we've worked with and the pastors that we've worked with have told us they have used to introduce this to, um, to their congregations. So it's not really our judgment about sort of which books are the best, 
but these are the ones that people are actually using. Every Good Endeavor by Tim Kelly and Catherine Gary Allstore. Catherine is on our steering committee. Uh, Work Matters by Tom Nelson. Uh, Work, A Kingdom Perspective on Labor by Ben Witherington, who's a New Testament professor, uh, and various others. I think any one of these, if you were to say, the way I want to go about it is to read one or more of these, take it all on board, and then in a series of sermons, how, however long that might be, bring my congregation up to speed, that, that'd be a very solid way of getting started. And it's probably how most churches get started on this journey, the preaching part of this journey. All right, what I want, really want to talk more about is, is the little bites about work in every sermon, or as one of our members calls it, drip feeding, or, or lifelong learning, if you want to use that category. The idea is that the way all of us are formed in church for a, a life of, in Christ uh, is not by learning something once and remembering it the rest of our lives, but by having it brought up in sermons and talked about week by week. It's true of marriage, or it's true of uh, forgiveness, it's true of prayer, and it's true of being equipped to follow God at work, too. So what are some of the ways that you can go about that? Well, again, we've assembled some of those on our, on our website in the Include Work in Your Preaching. And the one I want to most highlight is called Use the Theology Work Bible Commentary to Include Work Whenever You Preach. And this is probably our central resource that we offer, the POW Bible Commentary. If you clicked on that page, you would you'd come to this, which introduces the commentary uh, with a few paragraphs of what it's about. And then it offers links to every book in the Old Testament and every book in the New Testament. Uh, and then if you click on those links, it, it takes you to a table of contents of which passages are covered. About 850 or almost 900 passages of scripture are, are now covered in this commentary, you can access this way, that just talk about the passage, a little bit about its historical, uh, not historical, but um, biblical, theological, biblical theological, uh, meaning, you know, a small amount of exegesis and interpretation, but not trying to repeat what any other commentary would cover. And then what it might apply, what it might say that applies to work. Uh, and so with over 900 passages, almost 900 passages covered, whatever you might be preaching about anyway, we hope this offers a little bit to think about how I could apply this to work. That might be 10 seconds or one or two minutes in an ordinary sermon to just ask, well, what does this mean when you're at work? Let me give a few examples. Um, I'm going to, so let's start with 1 Corinthians 12. I'm just going to advance that to a minute, uh, in a minute, and Tessa will help me with this in a moment. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, of course, is about the gifts of the Spirit. And so if you went to that on our, on our website, uh, there's a text that talks about what spiritual gifts are or gifts of the Spirit are, of how they're, how they're applied in church, and also the idea that the same gifts, like helps or kinds of service, um, also apply outside of church. Uh, so it gives you some ideas there that you can incorporate into a sermon that's about 1 Corinthians 12, not about work, but about the passage. Apply it to work. And there's a video here that you, for instance, might even show if you do that in your church, or might give you some inspiration about examples. And Tessa, if you could play that video, it's only 60 seconds long. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, so um, I actually wasn't able to hear any audio on that uh, on that uh, on that slide. Um, was any, was anybody yeah, else able to hear it? It came through for me, Will. I was able oh, to hear. It. Okay, great, fantastic. So I don't have to <laughs> repeat what's in it. So that's the kind of thing that we hope would be valuable to uh, to a sermon about a wet work that would just give an example of how it apply about First Corinthians twelve that would give an example about how it applies to work. I think that's the hardest part for a preacher to talk about work. It's not that the concepts are unfamiliar to anyone who's competent in biblical exegesis and interpretation. It's just hard to know how do you apply this in a way that's meaningful to the people in your congregation, the various kinds of work they have. And so we try to provide examples like this whenever possible. Uh, I'm going to go back to the page uh, that just showed some other examples and talk briefly about a couple, a couple more. Uh, Mark 1, 1 through 6, this includes the passage where um, it talks about you know, Jesus, um, Jesus the builder, you know, being regarded as a carpenter. And a good illustration there about somebody who is a builder explaining why they think that's, that's service to God. Um, Matthew 8, 9, the, the kingdom is, that's a part of the section of Matthew where Jesus is talking about the coming kingdom. Um, and there's a, there's a terrific video illustration for that one, too, uh, about a young woman talking about uh, how her work in fashion, of all things, contributes to uh, the work of the kingdom of God. And, and uh, we might not have time to play that. But if we do at the end, I'd love to show that video because uh, I'd always suspected fashion was a, a, a suspect industry. And yet this woman talks about how it is a way to both talk about God with her coworkers and also serve people. Another would be Matthew 5, it's actually 5, 5, that's a typo on this slide. Uh, part of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek, one of the Beatitudes. With an illustration from uh, Peter Pace, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military, talking about uh, being a Christian, having Jesus' words, blessed are the meek, but also being a platoon commander in Vietnam. You know, what does it mean to be meek if you're leading, leading an army unit? Uh, and talking about uh, how important it was for him to understand the meaning of that. Uh, and how it applies uh, not only to the army, but to all kinds of work. Uh, or another one, one of my favorites, uh, the chapter two of Ruth, um, in which Boaz, the landowner, uh, uh, not only lets Ruth glean on his land, but actually invests with her as a worker and creates probably the world's first recorded uh, anti-sexual harassment uh, policy. Uh, it's laid out right there in Ruth 2.17. Uh, and so there's you know, if you went to that passage, you see some ideas there about how to apply that to the ordinary workplace uh, with the video reflection. So those are just some examples. Like I say, there are hundreds of passages, and uh, if you if you uh, don't often if you don't preach necessarily from a passage of scripture, but preach on a topic, there's a search function on the website, so you can search almost any word or topic, and that will guide you to the passages uh, that have something to say about that topic. The final question I want to ask about preaching is just, you know, am I making this harder than it needs to be? We, we've talked to a number of pastors over the years who said, I, I'd like to do this. Um, I'd like to equip my people, but it just seems like starting another ministry. There's just so many things to do in my congregation. Starting a ministry sounds awfully hard. And the question, um, uh, the, the approach I'm su suggesting is just say a little bit about work kind of every time you preach. All right, let me again see if there's anyone who has any questions about that, um, about, about preaching. All right, I'm going to go on then to some of the other things that churches do, uh, starting or moving next to worship. Uh, here again, we have a similar page on that uh, uh, from from below that pastor's portal, uh, with a bunch of ideas for worship. So I'll just highlight four of them. But one is doing vocational interviews in church. This actually is this actually does take some preparation, but if you can talk to someone in advance in advance of the of the you know the worship, find out about their work, and then just interview them in church. It takes about five minutes. To ask what's your work. Where do you see God in it? And usually people don't really have a good answer for that, so you have to make it okay for them to say, I'm not really sure. What are your challenges and opportunities? Not just religious challenges, but the challenges you actually get paid to help solve and opportunities. And how can we pray for you? Uh, churches that have done that have found it to be tremendously powerful for helping people get the vision of how their work would be service to God. 
Uh, likewise, on the bottom left, the bottom right of this page, commissioning to vocation and daily life. A number of churches actually commission people, maybe on Labor Day or some other time of the year, to the, the different vocations that they're part of, to help them understand that your work is not just something you happen to do as a Christian, it's part of your life in Christ. We also have a collection of hymns, songs, and poems about works. Um, a lot of pastors have said, I have this terrible feeling that even if I do talk about work in the sermon, then we go right around and kind of erase everything I've done by you know, singing a hymn uh, like, uh, cast, how's that one go? Cast your eyes upon Jesus, see only him, and all the, all the things of the world will go strangely dim. You know, we kind of uh, uh, undo the theology of work. Uh, so we try to collect passages and poems and, and, and hymns, songs, uh, that actually do talk about work. And the one I want to show you just a little bit about is a collection of prayer materials that could be included in worship services, kind of similar to hymns. And so there's a, again, if I just take, click on that, on that button, this would take me to the collection. And I want to show you one, Let's see if I can find it. This is just one of the ones I got from that table of contents on the right. Let us thank God for hard work and for the people who do it. And the prayer goes, let us thank God for the gift of life and the resources of the world, for our share in the continuing work of creation, for human skill and inventiveness, enterprise and hard work, for industry, commerce, and administration, and its many products of food, transport, roads, houses, clothing, medicines, uh, machines, fresh water, sewage disposal. It's just a prayer like that that gives thanks to God for the work that people do and the, the creativity and the results that come from it. So we have a collection of those. Okay, let me move on to um, another category of things that churches do, which is small groups. And in many churches, uh, sermon, uh, small groups may be either number two or even number one uh, of, uh, in terms of impact on how people's uh, Christian formation occurs. Either sermons or small groups are usually the most influential. And so we've provided, again, a series of small, uh, several series of small group studies. I wouldn't recommend starting small groups about work because that's too much like creating a workplace ministry. But these are the kind of things that an existing small group, you might recommend, hey, why don't you try one of these, uh, uh, either, either for one session or for a few weeks. So let me give an example just of one of those in the series, the very first series here called One Hour Small Group Studies of Workplace Topics. If you click that, uh, you get a list of them. One of them is ambition, and here it is. No preparation is needed. Oh, it'd be good, be good if the group leader reads it in advance. But the members of the small group don't have to prepare anything in advance. They can just come, read this together. There's a video link for a video they can watch to kind of get the discussion started. Some questions, uh, and, and it can be finished in, in one hour. And it could be done just once. Or you could do some of the other, a small group could do some of the other sessions that go along with it, uh, uh, parallel to it. I chose ambition because I think that's something that Christians struggle with at work. Uh, I think there's a kind of Christian uh, impulse not to be too ambitious, right? It's to be the opposite of blessed are the meek, or the meek, or at least seem to be the opposite of blessed are the meek. And yet ambition is something that's acquired in a lot of, in a lot of, um, in a lot of jobs that Christians have. So I, I've found that believers who, you know, who work outside of the church often do struggle with this question. And so spending an hour talking about it can be actually very helpful to them. Some of the other topics we've got, I think our number one topic is, is uh, recovering from failure. What to do if you make a mistake at work or lose your job, get fired, whatever. Um, how do you handle that from a Christian perspective? Uh, bad boss is probably our number two, a road conflict with a coworker. So a lot of really practical topics. All right, and the third area uh, of things that churches are already doing that could be used for equipping people for work is pastoral care and counseling. And I think this is also very simple. Um, there's kind of three, three main elements. One is just ask your people what their work is. And when they tell you, you know, express some interest and go deeper, uh, but don't give advice. Uh, and so I realized uh, having been a pastor in two, three different churches, I actually had very little idea what my people's work was. And I probably had gotten their title once or had a very brief impression of what their work was. But if I ever stopped to ask them, tell me what you actually do, what you do, my impression of what their work is usually not very close to what their actual work is. 
just expressing interest makes makes a big difference. Makes a, makes a big difference. Uh, the second step, which is kind of the same thing but deeper, is to visit people at work or as close as you can get. I found that a lot of people did really welcome me to visit them in their offices because it's just kind of too weird in the financial district in Boston or too unsafe if they work in a in a factory to have the pastor actually come where they work. But they might be willing to have lunch with me, you know, at a restaurant nearby. And again, find out about the work, ask those questions. But I think it's very not very helpful to immediately begin giving advice. And finally, to come up to speed on pastoral care in situations where you're not the expert. Maybe this does get into a space where now they're asking for help on something. And we found a few practices that help there. Uh, one is to just understand what does it mean to give pastoral care in an area where I, I, I'm not the expert. Pastors often think that the problem that the person's coming to them with is caused by the fact that the workplace is sinful and hostile and, and or that the person who has, the, that it has come to them is afraid or unwilling to do the right thing. And so the pastor's job is to tell them what the right thing is or exhort them to do the right thing. So I think pastors often think work is sinful and hostile and the hard part there is bucking yourself up to do the right thing. But often I find what the problem really is or in the mind of the, the person who's come is actually the workplace is confusing and complicated. Not always sinful, sometimes good, but it's confusing and complicated to know what the right thing is. They have the domain knowledge of what their field is, but they've never learned how to apply the scripture. Uh, they didn't know, they've never learned what in the scripture applies to their workplace and how to think Christianly about their work, how to apply the scripture. And so your job is not to tell them what to do and exhort them to do it, but to help them learn to apply the scripture to their situational or domain knowledge. And I, that's just a, a different way of doing pastoral care than what I was trained in. And so the steps that we found helpful have been, first of all, clarify the real situation. This is like any other pastoral care counseling. Try to find out what, what the real situation is, which might not be identical to what the person presents there. And then ask, what in the Bible does this bring to mind? Possibly offer your own ideas, like, well, this reminds me of the parable of the Good Samaritan or Ruth and Boaz or whatever it might be, to help them develop a stability to bring the scripture into dialogue with their, with their situation. And then discuss the situation in light of the Bible. Ask, where in the text do you see that? And then finally, uh, how does this help you get a faith perspective? Rather than, here is the Christian answer. It, it requires a kind of collaboration between the pastor who has a lot of knowledge of scripture and interpretation and application, and the prisoner who um, has a lot of knowledge about the situation and the domain, how to develop a partnership to bring those together. One of the things that can help with that in terms of identifying passages in scripture to discuss with, the, with someone who's looking for care or counseling is the tag system on the POW website. So under our advanced search function, you can get a list of tags. This is just me cutting and pasting pages one through six out of 10. So this is about 60% of the tags. So if someone comes with a question about confidentiality or conflict or uh, faith at work or fairness or failure, guilt, growth, addiction, you mean you know, hundreds of these topics, there actually is something in scripture to help them think about that in the workplace context. And for me, working on the Theology of Work project, this has been the huge surprise. How much of the Bible applies to work? I mean, I've been at Gordon Conwell in this field for 10 years before I started with this project. And I thought, oh, maybe there's 50, maybe there's 100 passages of, scriptures, of scripture that would apply to work, but we found nearly 1,000. And maybe that's because um, the Bible isn't really so much a, a book about um, the church. It's a book about God. And God shows up wherever God's people are. And mostly, that's at work. That's where we spend our time. Okay, I'm drifting into why this is important. Let me go back to how. Uh, another place to get some, some how kind of help is from madetoflourish.org. And if you're a pastor and you're not a member of Made to Flourish, uh, I think you might want to consider uh, signing up for them. It's free and they offer a lot of um, very valuable resources, uh, including things on their website. And they have a page called 
faster practice integration. You can get more stuff there for free. Now, finally, I thought I'd just highlight um, something else on our website that could be valuable to you, which is we have a, a series of real stories about churches impacting work. A number of the pastors that we've worked with have said, okay, you've, told, you've kind of told me all I can take about the about idea. I can't take any more ideas. <laughs> what I really want to know is show me a church that's doing this. Uh, I know Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York is doing a lot with faith and work, but we're nothing like them. We don't have 5,000 members. We're not in New York. Show me something, show me a church that I can recognize. What are they doing? How's it working? And so we've been collecting uh, examples of faith and work initiatives in churches. It's probably more than 30 at this point. Uh, and uh, an article kind of weaving it all together, the equipping church that tries to draw conclusions or draw um, practices from the models we've seen in, in various churches. And so I commend both of those to you also if you're looking for more hows. One thing that we have learned ourselves, because many of us in the project are pastors, and from pastors we've talked to, is it's a bit, it's a big, a bit frightful to think about embarking on this journey of equipping people for faith and work. I mean, I've certainly faced the question, because I'm finding it hard enough to find enough volunteers to do the things the church has to do. If, every, if everybody actually believed that what they do outside of church is also service to God, would they, will they stop volunteering? Will they stop thinking church is important? Will they stop giving to the church? You know, will we will will I will I run out of what we need to keep the church going? And the only only thing we can um, add to that is, you know, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Uh, yeah, it's a bit scary. It can be a bit scary. What what if I what if someone asks me for help and I I'm not expert? I don't know the answer. That's scary too. But do it anyway. Uh, and now I'm I'm ready for any questions people might have. Well, thanks, Will. Um, it sounds like uh, we probably have time for that other video that you had mentioned as well. Uh, should we maybe let me give some instructions for the uh, how people can ask questions and uh, maybe we can queue up that other video. Does that sound all right to you? Yeah, that sounds great. So uh, as we uh, turn to the video, uh, just would point folks down to uh, either the chat feature or the uh, Q&A box. Uh, if you have some questions that have been raised for you, as Will has walked us through some features of the Theology of Work project, uh, now is a good time to be typing in some of those questions in uh, that field. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to these questions uh, after we have a chance to watch this second video. Will, did you have any setup for the video you'd like to share prior to Tessa starting that? Uh, no, I think if she can just show it, and you can imagine how this could be useful to a small group or in, in, a, in, a, in a worship service if you show videos in your worship. Tremendous. So, Tessa, we'll uh, turn to you.
Well, great. Uh, glad to be able to watch that uh, video as well. And uh, we'll welcome uh, Will back. I see some questions starting to trickle in. Uh, um, first of all, from uh, Howard, I uh, appreciate this line of question that he has raised. Um, what you've discussed seems like helping people think that their work matters to God, which it certainly does. But what are the next steps to help them see how their work advances the kingdom, not just seeing the work as an end in and of itself? And then uh, Howard follows up. Uh, it feels a bit like helping people see a kind of uh, uh, a vague kind of helping others that may or may not point to the kingdom. And I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that, Mel. Yeah, thanks. That's a, that's a terrific question. Um, and and because I because this isn't primarily a discussion about what is a, the, a good theology of work, I realize I haven't said much about that. Um, where to start? I guess I think a lot of people, um, I think a lot of Christians, you, you know, despite despite whatever um, great instruction they might have gotten over the years, still kind of think of um, uh, the main point of the Christian faith is to um, get into heaven. Ho hopefully they understand that this has something to do with belief in Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. Uh, uh, and, and so the kingdom they equate with something that happens later. Uh, after you die, you go someplace else, and there's the kingdom. And so I do think a lot of Christians have difficulty with kingdom language. Uh, so part of it's, a, you know, a good theology of the kingdom, which is part, part of your ongoing task as a religious educator, that the kingdom is actually God had a plan for the creation, which is why he created it in the first place. You see the beginnings of that plan in Genesis that involves human cooperation with God in the flourishing of the, of the world that God created. It went bad with the fall, humanity's choice in the fall, and that God is working to restore uh, all things. And then it culminates uh, in, you know, Rev as we see in Rev Revelation 21 and 22, with the restoration of God's, of God's kingdom, the, the city, or the center of the city that returns to earth, and the whole heavens and earth are remade the way God intended from the beginning. Now, what are the specifics of that? Right? Some of those are given in Revelation itself, the healing of the nations. Um, some of the, the, the bringing of the uh, the kings bring the glory. The peoples bring the glory of the of the earth into the kingdom. So that so that, that suggests to me that the things that we that we create or, or build are themselves of some value. Nonetheless, work is not an end in itself. Um, I think Revelation 21 and 22 are primarily commentary on um, or an expansion, or, or they're rooted in Isaiah 60 to 65. So we see the themes of, of, of justice, reconciliation. Nations are not at war with one another, but instead you know, turn, turn the swords into plowshares. Uh, to go back to the Beatitudes, uh, uh, you know, the, um, to go back to blessed are the meek, the specific content of that passage as explicated by General Pace was, um, even if I'm in command, I need to recognize that God has given in my, in my organization a multitude of gifts to people who see the reality, who see what needs to be done. And so good organization, good leadership is making sure everyone is listened to, even if at the end one person has the um, responsibility of making the decision. Um, or another one, another passage I think is really use, important and useful is Jesus teaching on conflict. This is in Matthew um, 18, 15 through 17, if I remember right. Or, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, if you have something against a brother, go to him by yourself, explain what your, uh, what his offense was. And if he listens to you, you receive a friend uh, back. But if not, then take one or two trusted people with you, uh, elders. And if that doesn't work, then go to the whole church. So it's a conflict resolution model that's focused on restoring the, the relationship rather than getting your way. And I, and I think that's one of Jesus' teachings of what the kingdom is. Is that you begin to ask, answer your question, Howard, or do I need to be even do I need to be more specific in any way, or do you disagree? That's possible too. I think that's helpful, um, you know, Will. And as I think about some of these issues, I think about holding uh, Howard notes. That's helpful and and offers a word of thanks. Uh, as I think about some of those dynamics as well, it's really sort of holding together both both the the sense of the creation mandate and the Great Commission. Uh, both important calls that are on the Christian life that are complementary, not com uh, not combative, and so that affirms both the intrinsic value of work, 
but also sometimes the um, the instrumental value of work. And uh, even the video that we were watching, you could hear um, her talking about the fashion industry in both of those kinds of ways. Uh, viewing it as a pathway to glorify God, viewing it as her mission field. Um, those are instrumental elements, and that doesn't d speak to the full value of the work itself, because there is intrinsic value as well. Uh, but I wonder if, if some of those themes uh, help him as well. Uh, Howard notes, and by, by kingdom, I meant both the now and the not yet in his uh, reflections. Yeah, Howard, that's a great addition, the, the now and the not yet aspect, because uh, I, I think a difficulty I've experienced, you know, in the pew, uh, listening to sermons, is that my pastor often finds a way to um, give an illustration of a, of a, of a point in a, in a sermon that kind of leads to a terrific outcome. You know, everything in, in this illustration, the illustration seems kind of a range so that the principle from the scripture is applied and the result is wonderful. Um, uh, so, sort of, sort of the, as if the not yet had already occurred. Mm -hmm. But in those workplaces, you know, I find that it's not a choice between good and bad. It's a choice between, you know, imperfect and more imperfect. Uh, and so, so, so sometimes uh, the work towards the kingdom, um, um, you know, doesn't lead to the, the kind of wonderful story. Um, uh, and, a, and a neat bow the, the way the way the end of a sitcom does or the end of the, end of the sermon often does. And instead it resolves in, uh, you know, I had a, to go back to this conflict. I had a conflict with my coworker. I went, I, try, I tried to use Jesus' conflict resolution approach. And I think we did get through this particular conflict, but, you know, we haven't exactly become best friends yet. Although I guess learning to talk to one another respectfully actually is worth something. And that, that's the kind of, that's more than now, right? That's the, that's the, um, the, the, the inbreaking of the kingdom um, in, in, in one way, but not complete yet. And, and paying attention to the now and the not yet in preaching illustrations, I think it's, it's a great idea. Uh, Ying Yang offers a, a follow-up um, comment, and, and Howard says, uh, uh, thanks very much for what you just shared. Uh, Ying Yang notes, uh, how do we incorporate the Great Commission into this sort of uh, integrated approach? Um, so kind of a similar line of questioning there of how, how is the Great Commission uh, woven into that line of uh, viewing our work in an in integrative manner? I think my, my, first, my first thought is, well, the, the Great Commission includes, includes um, making disciples, right? So the Great Commission is, is, is not really go, go make converts. Mm -hmm. It's go make disciples, teaching them everything that I have taught you. And so in some, in some sense, uh, the discipleship of work, learning, learning what Jesus talked about that applies to work and learning to apply it is in itself the Great, the great Commission. Uh, so I, I guess I don't draw a distinction between evangelism as the Great Commission and, uh, and uh, the more material aspects of work as being only the um, the creation mandate. I mean, I, I think those are helpful centers. Those are helpful ideas, but mm -hmm. but nonetheless, uh, making a disciple a means, you know, m more than more than just evangelism. If that's the question, sure. Um, repeat the question because I'm not sure that I might I might got sidetracked here. I, th uh, I think you're you're in line with that. Uh, we certainly I know around Bethel and other other uh, friends in the network. The language of whole life discipleship mm -hmm. is really a key part of this discussion. It's how are we calling people to be followers of Christ, not just in the segments of their life, but the whole of their lives. And I think you're noting that theme in the Great Commission is important. Ying Yang's well, exact, exact question was, how do we incorporate the Great Commission into this sort of integrated approach? Yeah. So if, if I can, I hope, I hope this is coming close if I say part of that question is, you know, how do we share the good news of Jesus Christ with the people that we care about through our, that we work with and therefore care about, um, you know, alongside the other things we might do that, uh, that are par part of the story of the kingdom. And that's why I love this video of, of, the, of this young woman in fashion, uh, because, you know, I grew up in a household that, I mean, I, 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 I believe that fashion is vanity, right? The idea that you spend money was not seen as a good thing to be spending money on fashion or, or adornment or whatever. It was seen as either vanity or waste. So I'm very challenged by the content of her work in some ways. Um, and yet on the other hand, she's paying attention to quality. Uh, 
anyway, she has a reason for thinking the work of fast is, is valuable, you know, in, in kingdom in, in kingdom restoration terms that was surprising to me. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, she actually spends quite a bit of her time talking about being able to talk with a coworker. Yeah. And the yeah. coworker says, why are you happy? Like, this is such a depressing industry. We have to do the same thing. Why are you happy all the time? And she gets a chance to talk in a real way to someone who you know, probably wouldn't have responded to a evangelistic message um, in, in another format. Ying Yang uh, followed up in, in kind of speaking to that uh, area that you just focused on of, uh, you know, how do we teach those in the workplace to make disciples? I've heard some folks in the Center for Faith and Work at Redeemer talk about uh, doing faith and work integration well provides a plausibility structure for the gospel. That yeah. it, it speaks to the efficacy of the gospel, that it really works in people's lives. And, um, you know, that's another angle that has been helpful to hear uh, from the Redeemer folks. Yeah, you know, Dor Dorothy Shares, you know, who wrote all those uh, mystery novels, uh, was also uh, uh, had a long running show on the BBC on, on theology. Uh, she said the first thing that the church must teach a carpenter is make good tables. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because no one is going to listen to a carpenter talk about Jesus if the carpenter isn't making good tables. They have no, no credibility. Well, great. Uh, we have uh, two more questions, and we actually are kind of running uh, kind of close up on the end of our time. So let me just throw both questions out to you and uh, let you uh, engage them, and we'll go from there. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, from um, Robbie noting, uh, do you think that pastors are more biased towards thinking that pastoral work is of most importance? And how often do you see pastors with a balanced perspective? So that's we'll, we'll take that one for a minute here, and then I'll, I'll feed you another question. No, I, I'm not sure I believe that pastors are more, more biased towards believing that, past, that being a pastor is a higher calling or more important. I think Christians are more biased about that. I, mean, I, I think that exists on, you know, on, I, I, think it's, I think it's a very common belief. I think it's a wrong belief. Uh, but I don't think that pastors are sort of more biased by it than people in the congregation mm -hmm. are. I also think it's a belief that not many millennials have. So the privilege that we pastors have of being thought of as having a higher calling is now held by, by environmentalists, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very helpful. Yeah, probably the, that sort of sacred secular divide and how we view different types of work might have been stronger uh, in past decades than it is now. Uh, we have another uh, participant that just notes the, the value that Tom Nelson's Work Matters book has been to them. They've used it as a supplement in their entrepreneurship seminar, and uh, it really had some useful information that they found in there. Also noting that there is some good news uh, of work, and we are created to work, and that we, um, we also are gifted for work, those themes of uh, work's value there. Well, Will, uh, we are so thankful that you've been able to, to be with us today. And uh, I know personally I've benefited from the Theology of Work Project. My little quick uh, uh, quick story on that is a small group that I was in this, in this past year. Uh, we're engaging some of the faith work themes, but we were just sort of doing our normal reading plan through the scriptures. And that was the, that was the substance of our small group time. Uh, but I'd often just turn to uh, the commentary, Theology of Work commentary, as little, little – uh, um, work themes would kind of pop up, and I, don't, you know, I was working through Exodus as an example, and uh, in the version I was reading, the, the language of fine twined linen kept popping up, and it was, you know, the value of this, the linen workers, and and what they were doing in uh, building the tabernacle and adorning the priests, and uh, we had some conversations about this sort of intrinsic value of work in that context in Exodus, and those themes popped up as we had a great resource like the Theology of Work Project to turn to as a small group. So thank you for how you blessed me and our church. And I know that uh, it's been a valuable resource for many others. Thanks, Justin.